that we did not particularly set up the M&Ms to talk about blunt thoracic trauma, um, but the timing couldn't be perfect, uh, more perfect to uh, ask Dr. Ian Brown, who is really looking at this problem in a very rigorous scientific way to help understand better what's really going on with these patients and also uh, conceivably, ultimately, to figure out how to treat these patients better. So it's with great pleasure I introduce our own Dr. Brown with this uh, fantastic work. So, Thank Ian. You. Thank you, Dr. Farmer. As, as stated, uh, my name is Ian Brown. Uh, most of you I've met, some of you not yet, but we will. And I'll be talking about P-selectin-dependent pulmonary arterial thrombosis and blunt thoracic trauma. Uh, first of all, I want to start with a disclosure slide. I have no disclosures to report. It's usually the most boring slide in the talk, so I put a picture of the, the blue uh, grotto from Capri Island in Italy in the background. So give it some, something going on. So I was going to start with a case and then kind of work on into the, to the basic science aspects of it, just kind of to bring it all together. I want to start off with a, with a 74-year-old man. Oh, it's like deja vu. See, we didn't even plan that. <laughs> so I had no idea what was going on today, this morning for uh, Eminem. But um, as it turns out, I should have just called Jamie and asked her for her slides. Um, <laughs> Anyway, because of that, I can blow through a lot of this. You guys were paying attention earlier, so you know that the patient ended up having an OR uh, left thoracotomy, a trauma thoracotomy, and a lobectomy, uh, wedge resection of 25% of the left upper lobe, and then was transferred for consideration of ECMO. Uh, patient transferred in the usual way. Um, that's an actual file that we got uh, in relation to a certain fellow who I don't see here, but uh, for some reason they always miss his name. Uh, the part that I want to focus on, the patient actually did receive some heparin initially, but then ended up having to have it held because of, uh, of, of a head injury, as was mentioned previously. And then on post-operative day six, uh, the CT chest demonstrated segmental bilateral PEs with right heart strain, uh, as was shown in the image uh, previously, and I'll just highlight it again, although I think her picture was better than mine. But I put a blue arrow just in, so. Um, again, uh, another point of this was that uh, when they, the vascular lab did a study, there was actually no DVT present. So it's likely that the, uh, that the clot didn't, was not a classic embolism, but actually formed uh, in situ in the lung tissue itself, uh, which is a very different natural history than what we've classically come to associate with PEs. And it turns out that that's something that is a recurring theme with blunt thoracic trauma. So blunt thoracic trauma uh, is involved with 20 to 50 percent of the annual 200,000 trauma deaths that we see. So that's quite a big number. Uh, has a number of complications associated. We've seen pulmonary contusions, as we have here in the image, uh, ARDS, uh, organ failure, PEs. Um, and in fact, thoracic trauma patients are twice as likely to have a, some sort of thromboembolic event. Um, so historically, we've always thought of PEs as being something that started in a deep vein, right? And uh, then sort of broke off and then it sort of showered as it went through the pulmonary circulation. And if it was a big enough clot, uh, then it would be uh, causing a little bit of right heart strain and decrease the perfusion of that lung tissue, and then that could be potentially fatal. Um, however, the clots that we see in uh, blunt thoracic trauma are a little bit different. So when you normally see a PE form, it takes a little while. Usually it's like a week or two out. Oh, that's weird. I didn't even do that. <laughs> um, and so uh, it takes, it's about a week or two out that it forms, but these clots are forming within hours, in fact. You can see them sometimes on initial CTs or on very early follow-up CTs. And they're forming in the absence of, uh, of a DVT, as mentioned previously, which means that two things. One, if you have a patient with a combined polytrauma issue like uh, like a intracranial hemorrhage or a solid organ injury, 
and you need to anticoagulate a patient or treat that patient for, or prevent them from having a worsening uh, PE, you can't use anything like a filter. It's not going to work, right? Because it's not embolizing. Uh, two, because these events are occurring so early, the anticoagulation has a different level of risk. Uh, it's not like uh, you can give the prophylactic dose and kind of hope things go okay for a while. You actually have an, an active clot that you have to treat therapeutically and it's occurring very early on after the acute trauma so then potentially at least in theory the risk of bleeding is much higher. So this was the question that we wanted to study. We wanted to kind of demonstrate what the differences were in the natural history of those type of clots and see if there was some kind of different intervention that we could think of uh, that might allow us to treat these in a safer way given the risks associated with anticoagulation. So when the lab started, uh, our lab project scientist Rob, who's sitting over there in the front, got together with Jim Becker, who also may not, may not be here. That's him pictured, as, you probably can't read it, it says Thug Life on his fist because he's different. And um, they got together and developed a very simple but reproducible weight drop model to induce a pulmonary uh, contusion kind of injury, a blunt thoracic trauma injury. And all it was is very simple. We just basically placed a mouse that was essentially the same size usually underneath a pipe dropped a 50 gram brass weight um, at a specific distance that was going to give us as big a contusion as we could get without killing the mouse. Um, and we also wanted the contusion to be limited just to uh, the lung tissue. There's a lot going on in the chest area. We had to rule out a cardiac injury as well. Um, and so this was our initial model and as you can see it develops a pretty nice uh, pulmonary contusion for the mouse. Um, just, I haven't, I'm not going to show this, but uh, just to demonstrate that there was no cardiac injury, we used multiple methods. We tunnel stained the actual cardiac tissue, and then we also checked troponins, myoglobin, CKMB. All those things were no different than the sham, so the injury was uh, pretty limited to the cardiac tissue. And, uh, Turns out that the higher the weight and the more energy transferred, uh, the more severe the lung injury score. Lung injury score is something that we use to sort of standardize how badly the lung is injured. That's based on uh, alveolar thickness, uh, amount of hemorrhage, and, uh, and basically that, that those are the essential criteria. Um, and we see an injury both on the coup side, the direct injury side, as well as the contra coup injury. Yeah, cellularity as well. So, and then uh, this is just another closer look. And you can see sort of in the, uh, in the A box what the contusion looks like on a, mic on a microscopic level, sort of an area that's a little bit more uh, infused with uh, hemorrhagic tissue. So, all right. Uh, just to further quantify it, we had one of our other lab uh, fellows, Nassim, who many of you all know. She came in and did a very nice analysis of the cytokine milieu in the uh, local tissue, sort of characterized uh, both what tissues uh, were being sort of uh, invaded with as far as leukocytes as well as what they were producing. And as you would predict, um, you get a lot of neutrophil influx very early on with a lot of inflammatory cytokine production, including uh, IL-6, TNF, and to some degree uh, GCSF, which is a pretty standard inflammatory response. Next came the, uh, the interesting part for us, at least initially, we needed to demonstrate that the thrombus that was formed was actually an in situ thrombus uh, rather than a clot. Um, we didn't do this, we sort of did it in, in an indirect way. We sort of surmised it based on the fact that when we stain in the arteries of the lung that have been injured for fibrin, uh, what we see is actually an eccentric accumulation. So it, it accumulates along the edges and starts from the outside in rather than seeing um, 
something that looks irregular and not shaped to the shape of the uh, vascular wall. This suggests that the fiber deposition is actually occurring in situ uh, rather than um, an embolic event. Any questions? Um, and it turns out that the more energy you give to that injury, uh, the more fibrin deposition that you get as one might expect. It's just a greater accumulation in amount. So, so where did we go from there? Um, essentially, we thought, okay, so is this an active process or a passive process? And we thought, okay, well, it's occurring directly where we would think it occur. It's probably an active process, so what would be mediating this? Um, and that sort of turned our attention to cell adhesion uh, molecules. Um, cell adhesion molecules are something that you learned about probably that one week in medical school when they talked about leukocyte adhesion and rolling, right? You guys saw, remember the graph and the leukocytes go through the vessel and it slows them down. Well, it turns out that one of those adhesion molecules is one called P-selectin. P-selectin not only helps with... Uh, with leukocyte rolling to slow down the leukocytes, but it also um, binds its ligand that is present on platelets as well and is uh, involved in the uh, platelet plug formation. So that was a pretty serious candidate for us as one that would be involved in uh, this process of, uh, of, of promise formation. So our initial working hypothesis was that endothelial activation and P-selectin expression promotes de novo pulmonary arterial thrombosis and blunt thoracic trauma. Um, a little bit more about P-selectin. Um, it's a protein that you kind of need exactly when you need it, and you don't have time to make it. And so the way that the body deals with that situation is it makes it and it keeps it on storage so that it's ready to go immediately. Uh, playlists keep it inside of what are called weevil palate bodies, which are these sort of like endosomes that like hold our little packets of protein, basically, and one of those is P-selectin. So as soon as the platelet is ready to be, is activated, those uh, vesicles fuse to the surface, the P-selectin is all present, and it starts to cause uh, uh, further platelet ac activation and aggregation or clumping that you'll see. Uh, it turns out endothelial cells also make it, I'm um, oh, sorry, play, I misspoke. Platelets stored in alpha granules and endothelial cells stored in what's called the weevil palate bodies. Uh, the ligand for this protein is, is called uh, P selectin glycoprotein ligand. They aren't always very creative, uh, but they are uh, able to, you know, be functional. So <laughs> that's what it's called. Um, again, and then I just want to, one more word about the rolling and the uh, tethering and the diapedesis. You guys remember that word, diapedesis, right? <laughs> uh, so if you think about it teleologically, do you want your diapedesis to occur in your big vessels or your super small vessels? Anybody? Small, okay, right. Why? Because you don't want to destroy the integrity of your big vessels with all the uh, cells just going right through the wall. You want that to happen in your small vessels. But you need things to slow down before they stop. So if you were going to design the system, where would you put the molecules associated with uh, the rolling in, as opposed to the ones involved with the diapedesis? You need the, the rolling ones upstream because you want to slow it down first so that you can stop it when you're, when you're ready, right? So it turns out that pulmonary uh, vasculature is sort of similar to that in that the larger pulmonary arteries tend to express things like P-selectin, but they don't express uh, the ICAMs uh, that you see that are involved in the diapedesis. Um, and, uh, and so... Uh, it, it's actually unique that way, and, and when we're looking at our vessels, particularly the vessels of the size that would be ones that would uh, be clinically relevant because they could cause heart strain and, uh, and you know, like widowmaker type clots, uh, we're going to be looking at the larger ones where the P-selectin is present, but other cell adhesion molecules like CAMs, like, like ICAM might not be so present. Um, the teleological thing, 
Um, I am not like a supreme being, so I, I kind of just made that up as a way that I memorize that. But uh, you got to kind of figure it out for yourself. But it makes sense for me, so that's kind of how I remember it. For those that think you're a supreme being. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it turns out in the presence of thrombus uh, formation, you end up having a lot of P-selectin present, both on the endothelia and uh, on the platelets. And there's also a fair amount that gets um, basically released by proteases from the cell surface of the endothelial cells, releasing active soluble uh, P-selectin as well into the bloodstream. And then all of that sort of gets together and results in big uh, accumulation of fibrin and platelet forming a nice plug um, it also facilitates um, early neutrophil and macrophage uh, invasion right in that same area because, as you remember, um, though they teach coagulation and immunology separate in uh, school just because it's easier to learn that way, when you have a hole, you need to do two things. You need to stop the blood from getting out and the bacteria from getting in, and economically it makes more sense to have one system that can do both processes and so that's actually what happens, right? It's a conservation of energy and, and effort. Uh, I sort of went over this already, though, so I'll skip that part. Except I will say that's a good picture of Rob, just in case anybody doesn't know what he looks like. Um, so when we looked in our in our injury model, basically, what we saw was that after we injured the model, just kind of, after we injured the mouse, just as kind of predicted, uh, the P-selectin actually ended up being expressed in the injured tissues, but not in the sham. And when we looked at uh, different um, cell adhesion molecules, such as CAM, uh, the CAM was present in the very small microvasculature in the surrounding tissue parenchyma, but the uh, P-selectin was present in the arteries that were most relevant to uh, what our study was, as predicted. It's also interesting in that it's present not only on the side of direct injury, but additionally on the opposite side as well. It's actually present throughout all of the lung tissue. So it seems that there's sort of a, a systemic activation of the endothelia in, within the lung tissue itself. So that's uh, means that there's going to be some risk for clot formation throughout the entire lung and not just in the area of the direct uh, injury where the energy was highest. Um, this picture, in addition to being a nice picture, actually shows uh, another thing that's interesting, which we'll touch on very briefly later, mostly because not too many people understand it yet. Um, in addition to the P-selectin being present in the endothelium, Right on the wall there, as you see. Oh, sorry. Oh, that's not what we wanted. I'll just say you can see the outline of the blood vessel wall there, right? And then you also see that thick, vascular, smooth muscle uh, underneath in the far picture um, all the way. And it turns out that the P-selectin ends up being expressed in that area as well. Um, that's been described in literature. Nobody fully understands it because the vascular, smooth muscle cells aren't really known for expressing P-selectin, but it is interesting um, because it occurs in denuded vascular injury models, um, such that suggesting that once you have exposure of the vascular smooth muscle, that inflammation also uh, promotes the same kind of response. Um, and that may have other implications as well with uh, vascular modeling and other things that we'll investigate down the road. So, we're pondering next, is P-selectin really necessary for pulmonary arterial thrombus after trauma? That's his pondering face. That's what he looks like right before he's about to do something that he's not supposed to. <laughs> so the next experiment was a pretty big experiment for us. Our hypothesis being that P-selectin is necessary for this clot formation in order to demonstrate that, we needed to find a way basically to block that molecule and show whether or not this clot actually happened. So one of the easier ways to block it uh, is to try to use an antibody that is able to specifically block that protein. Um, and that's kind of the, 
the way you do it first before you invest in knockout mice. So we found ourselves an antibody and we admit it. This is so crazy. And we administered that antibody uh, prior to the injury. And when we did that, um, we demonstrated um, that uh, if we use an isotype antibody just as a control and we injured it, the sham with no injury had uh, no effect. I'm going to try to make this work. Is that going to work? All right, I'm giving up on it. The sham injury, uh, the sham had no injury, but however, with the ice type control where the P selectin was not blocked, we were able to see in green the deposition of fibrin uh, present both in the injury side and the opposite side of the lung where so clots were actually forming. Oh, you got me. This guy right here. All right. Always call Gary This guy. So, isotype. Antibody, which is the nonspecific, did not block the fibrin. The fibrin was present. We see the P-selectin, the, what, we, what we thought was the P-selectin dependent clot formation in the larger vessel. Jeez. Um, however, when we used a specific antibody that could block the P-selectin, what we found was, in fact, that there was no clot that formed. And this was a key observation. This demonstrated uh, a necessity for the P-selectin for that clot to form and it gave us sort of a ticket like it's like okay well if we can block that piece like then we can prevent that clot from actually happening so this was pretty huge for us and when that happened uh, we celebrated for a minute um, and Linda actually got an award so it was pretty fantastic she was a resident in the lab at the time and uh, presented this at AAST and so that was a pretty great victory for all of us in the lab um, the next question was, what were we actually blocking with our antibody? So as I mentioned earlier, the P-selectin comes in multiple different forms. Um, there's the P-selectin that's present on the endothelial surface. There's the P-selectin that's present on the platelet walls. And then there's the soluble P-selectin as well. And so we were curious as to which of these compartments were actually uh, contributing to this clot formation or if any one of these is, was more necessary than the other. Um, this is a kind of a difficult experiment to do to separate out the compartments, at least without certain like specific tissue, specific knockouts. Um, so the first thing that we wanted to do was an indirect experiment. We wanted to see if the soluble P-selectin could actually contribute at all to the formation of the clot. Um, making it somewhat important. So, first of all, we wanted to measure that plasma selectin and see if it went up after the trauma, and in fact it did in a specific way. Um, so we thought, okay, well this is great, does it matter? So we got ourselves a construct of soluble activated P-selectin, and we actually sort of tipped the odds a little bit by adding an additional amount of that to the animals that did or did not get injured. What was interesting is that though the P-selectin that we added w was activated, so when we added it and we, did, and, uh, we, and we injured the mouse, we got huge clots, not just these little ones, but these actual massive clots that fully occluded the entire vessel. Um, but this is one of those times when the control like, is actually just as interesting as the experimental group. Because if we didn't injure the mouse, even though that P-selectin that we added was actually activated, it didn't touch any of the lung tissue. So it needed to have a cell service interaction as well, something that was necessary there. So we thought that that was uh, pretty neat. So just to summarize where we were to that point. One, we demonstrated that P-selectin uh, was necessary for these pulmonary arterial thrombi that we were seeing after our blunt trauma in our model. Two, um, the soluble P-selecting experiment demonstrated at least that there was some sort of level of endothelial activation or injury issue there locally that was required for the, for the clot to, to form. Uh, and three, the soluble P-selecting may or may not be necessary, but it certainly did at least in our hands potentiate uh, the, the seriousness of the clot that formed. Um, so then this led us to uh, sort of new directions and new questions to ask. Um, one, we wanted to know a little bit more about the natural history of the P-selectin expression. Um, 
and how it was necessary or important for both the initial clot formation as well as the stabilization, duration, and, and resolution of that clot. Um, the idea behind this was that if we were able to block that piece of lectin, is that something that could be used therapeutically to either prevent or treat uh, clot formation? Um, how long will we have to do that? And was it actually able to reverse a clot that was actually already present? Uh, two, uh, P-selectin has interactions with both the clotting pathways as well as the immune system and other things. So were there systemic implications involved with, um, with increasing P-selectin activity or with blockade of that activity? Like, could our therapy, uh, would it be detrimental in some way? So we got ready to do our next steps. That's Triple T. He's the office linebacker. You guys probably don't remember that. Anybody? Yeah. Triple T. Okay. <laughs> so we developed a new set of uh, specific aims, and uh, that's kind of where we are. And then luckily for us, the AAST thought that this was actually interesting, and they gave us a little bit of incentive and money to start looking at this, at least as of July 1st. Um, and so... We're going to go ahead and start, and we've been looking and investigating the role of P-selected in initiation, propagation, and resolution of the thrombi after the trauma, and looking at the systemic effects, as well as the end organ consequences of uh, P-selected, both the activation and the blockade of that activation. So, as far as systemic consequences of P-selected, so... When you get a clot, what we usually give heparin as the treatment, right? And heparin will affect your ability to form a blood clot, which is something that, at least acutely in the setting of trauma, um, is not necessarily a great thing, at least not initially. Um, what we wanted to know is if we block the P-selectin interaction, would that actually also affect the ability of the blood to coagulate? So what we wanted to do was look at viscoelastic properties of clot formation uh, in that setting. So we took uh, mice and we basically treated them with either a saline control with heparin uh, and a therapeutic dose or with the P-selectin antibody that blocked all P-selectin uh, interactions. And we looked basically at uh, sort of an equivalent of, of tag or rotin, basically the ability to, the time that it takes to start forming a clot and the rate at which that clot forms. So you have the clotting time and the alpha angle. And what we found was that, as predicted, when you add heparin to that situation, the, the time that you take to form the clot is pretty high. Um, and then the rate at which that clot forms is also uh, substantially reduced compared to control. When we looked at that with our P-selectin antibody, um, the time at which the clot formed was uh, slightly elevated, but not uh, in a, a statistic way. And then uh, the alpha angle was close to normal. So this suggested that our antibody wasn't impacting uh, clot uh, rate, at least the uh, potential for it, which is something that we thought uh, would be nice in a clinical setting where we didn't want that, uh, with any of those properties to be um, adjusted. Um, we did that initially in mice that weren't injured, and then we repeated those findings in uh, mice that actually were injured and had kind of the systemic changes that you might expect in an injured mouse and had similar findings uh, with respect to the alpha angle and the clotting time. So the next step with that was it's all fine and good if you have good numbers, but you need something that's a real bottom line uh, experiment that demonstrates uh, the relevance. So we wanted to recreate a situation similar to that patient that we had today, right? So the thing that scares us, one of the things that scares us the most in the setting of the need for anticoagulation is traumatic brain injury. What if we had a model either just of combined, uh, of a traumatic brain injury or of a combined model with blunt thoracic trauma and the traumatic brain injury and we looked at our interventions there? Um, we saw an example this morning of what can happen when you mix heparin into that situation. And uh, at least in that anecdote, it didn't turn out well. 
Um, and so we developed this model uh, with the help of Dr. Farmer and her lab, who also, uh, in a very nice turn of events, uh, needed a, an injury mechanism to create a, a central nervous system injury. Um, so there's a device that we use uh, that creates a uh, reproducible traumatic brain injury. Um, we get a cortical contusion, and then we can take that mouse and we can either treat them ahead of time with, uh, with a vehicle like saline or with heparin, either in a prophylactic or treatment dose, or with our P-selectin antibody. Um, the data on that is still forthcoming and it hasn't been completely analyzed. I did include a little picture of some of the um, brain slices there so you can see an idea of what the uh, traumatic brain injury looks like there. That's a little contusion there. And so what we're going to do is measure both grossly and uh, with some immunofluorescence the degree of hemorrhage that we get in all those situations and determine if there is statistically a difference between uh, the different interventions. Um, additionally, uh, we want to look at soluble organ injury. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, so you get a systematic or systemic uh, mobilization of activated platelets when you have such an injury and of uh, soluble P-selectin that ends up basically in your circulatory system. Um, if you have these activated platelets, they, while the lung injury seem to be an active deposition, it's possible that some of these clumps are going to end up passively going to places um, otherwise and causing all sorts of havoc. Uh, potentially. Um, the kidney is an area that gets a high vascular flow and it's also a place where filtration occurs so it's going to be one of those stop gaps basically where a lot of playlists can end up depositing and so uh, we wanted to sort of investigate whether or not our injury was actually causing uh, a, a, a kidney injury as well and an organ injury there and whether or not blockade of the P-selectin that we're using is actually able to limit that. Um, to this end, uh, we're looking uh, with a very small resolution at uh, a very early marker of kidney injury called kidney injury molecule one. Again, very creative title for a protein. Um, it's a protein that nobody knew what it actually does. They just knew that it showed up after an injury, so they named it thusly. Uh, our preliminary data shows that if we have a high enough energy injury, we actually do get up regulation of the uh, kidney injury molecule one. Um, that work actually was sort of how our lab initially was built. So it's funny how the, uh, the investigation has come in some ways full circle. Uh, first, we started interested in the, uh, in the uh, systemic end organ injury. Um, and so Jim, back when we were first getting our feet on the ground, uh, was one of the uh, original uh, people working on that project. And now we have uh, Juby, one of our other volunteers, or not volunteer anymore, but she's one of our workers who's uh, leading that uh, project. And she's just as enthusiastic as she looks in that picture. And so we're getting a lot of work done there. Um, additionally, as I mentioned earlier, the smooth muscles seem to be getting a little bit fired up and expressing some P-selectin as well. Um, we don't talk very much about what happens long term after we get a pulmonary injury, like a really massive contusion. Does it have a long term impact or effect? Um, I actually talked to the pulmonary critical care guys about it. If they ever see people showing up in clinic, you know, years down the road after these injuries with pulmonary hypertension or, or other issues like that. And it seems like nobody's really looked at it that well. Um, however, uh, we know that if you basically stimulate enough of that uh, P-selectin and get enough macrophage invasion there, there's a potential for a vascular remodeling, which can lead, at least in theory, to, um, to, to, vascular, to further vascular remodeling and pulmonary hypertension. Um, so we've been studying a few things associated with that. Uh, one is a molecule that is uh, associated with cellular proliferation. It's a nuclear protein, Ki67. And so uh, Harjeet over there, in the nice checkered shirt there, 
uh, has been looking at the expression of that early on and, and, and uh, seeing what happens as far as proliferation goes. Uh, we're looking at vascular smooth muscle hypertrophy and things like that to see if there is actually a long-term uh, event. We're also basically harvesting those pulmonary arteries as you see in the picture there. Uh, this is much easier in a human being. Um, and so we're taking those pulmonary arteries and we're studying them for a lot of different properties as far as um, how viable they are after the injury and what their calcium signaling properties are. So we're looking at kind of how functionally things change. That work is still very preliminary, but it, uh, it uh, reflects a very good collaboration that we have with some researchers actually on the main campus. Additionally, we think that um, this project extends well beyond uh, just pulmonary injury. Uh, we talked this morning, for example, about mesenteric vascular injury and blunt trauma. Um, and we think that basically any time that you have a vascular injury in trauma, there's going to be some cell adhesion molecule involvement, uh, depending on what kind it is and, and where it is. Um, however, there's potential that a lot of complications and a lot of thrombus formation is, is related to the expression of these. And so um, once you come to our lab, you start to drink the Kool-Aid, you start to see cell adhesion molecules everywhere, like in every M&M. They're all there and we're like, oh, we could probably put some antibody in there and stop it. That'd be great. Um, so what we want to do basically is, one, we want to start and see how we can uh, use our current protein, our current antibody to see what we can do to treat these, these, these lung injuries. But we also want to look at this as a revolutionary kind of way to sort of change current anticoagulation paradigms uh, in trauma and in uh, acute care surgery as well. Um, the other day, for example, we had a vascular injury uh, where an artery and a vein, a popliteal artery and popliteal vein were repaired. And then subsequently, despite anticoagulation, the vein went down, right? Uh, we don't know a lot about what the natural history is as far as cell adhesion molecules in that inflamed vascular tissue that might lead to those uh, repairs going down, but you could certainly imagine that if you actually cut endothelial tissue, it's gonna be angry. And so anything that we can do to kind of uh, quell that anger uh, might help us with our outcomes. Uh, so we see that in vascular repair. Um, and then sometimes we iatrogenically anger vascular tissue. So in trauma, we sometimes intentionally cause uh, uh, ischemia and reperfusion injuries. Uh, we'll do it either with a tourniquet or with a reboa or with a clamp. Um, anytime you put that thing down for a long enough time, the tissue distal to that gets angry. It starts releasing MCP and other chemokines and it starts upregulating cell adhesion molecules. So one of the things that we're thinking is, if we can basically see what the cell adhesion molecule expression is after we do that, we can understand why our Reboa only works really well if we only leave it up for 22 minutes and maybe we get 32 minutes out of it. Um, we can decrease potentially the reperfusion injury by one, preventing clot formation distal after we take the balloon down and two, by actually preventing leukocyte diapedesis uh, distal as, that, uh, as those cell adhesion molecules get expressed. So we, like I said, we see it everywhere. Uh, finally, even outside of trauma, sometimes we think about other things like transplant or pancreatitis. Um, we had a speaker here actually recently, a while back actually, who talked about pancreatitis and one of the complications of pancreatitis being that the the arteries and veins, they, they can clot off sometimes if the inflammation is bad enough in the area of, uh, of, the, of, the, you know, of the inflammation there in the pancreas. And so it's possible that the surrounding inflammation incites cell adhesion molecule expression locally in the vasculature there next to the pancreas. And that if we can prevent that, we can prevent um, any of that, that sort of clotting off of the vessel and have a uh, better viable pancreatic tissue. Uh, afterwards. Um, we even see it potentially, uh, although I think we do a great job with uh, organ transplant, um, there's always the potential for organ transplant. It's, it's another vascular anastomosis and there's always potential for uh, thrombus there too. Um, and 
that's another setting where you do it fast, right? Because you want to basically limit the amount of injury. But what if you could prevent the uh, anger in the vasculature that you get? And maybe you get a couple extra minutes and still have a, a decent outcome. That's okay. But you guys are totally fast and stay fast. It's going to be great. But it's just for, you know, for everybody else. So that's where we are, and uh, just sort of thank you. I, I don't want to kill you with too many like molecules and proteins and pathways because I know that surgery residents tend to love that stuff. But um, <laughs> but I do want to um, say uh, thanks to a lot of people that helped uh, put some of this stuff together. Uh, one, all the members, past and present of our lab, uh, they're a very dynamic group, and our lab is pretty young. So a lot of them started with me when uh, we had very little except for uh, friends and support around us. Uh, and so we, it, we built it from the ground up. Um, and a lot of them are sitting over here in the corner. So thank you everybody for making this uh, work. Definitely want to highlight uh, Rob Rigger, a project scientist who uh, basically is a, he's a machine. Uh, Linda, who did a lot of really great work for the lab and sort of really put us on the map uh, with a couple of things. Uh, also want, for anybody interested in trauma, um, our trauma group here has been very successful in the Committee of Trauma Competition, uh, both with clinical science, as Jesse will attest, and in basic science research. And I think uh, for the past three years at least, um, we've won the NorCal region, and we want to continue that uh, energy going forward. So uh, we're looking forward, uh, both in my lab and within the whole group, for motivated uh, people who just want to crush it. Um, Special thanks additionally to Dr. Farmer and Chris Favetti, the lab manager up there. Um, it's hard to get ahead in basic science research unless you have uh, friends and resources and you share uh, both uh, resources and intellectual stuff and discussion and make each other's projects better. You criticize each other and build each other up. And um, we always, uh, they, we get a lot of help. That's us. <laughs> we get a lot of help getting it off the ground, and it wouldn't be possible without all of that influence. Uh, Dr. Galante, he's probably basically in the lab uh, with the amount of uh, contribution he makes intellectually, but I didn't put him on that side, but he sort of is. Uh, and then uh, we get a lot of mentorship and sponsorship from Dr. Jerkovich, Greenhall, and Cho. Um, a couple of uh, collaborators, Drs. Nevado and Kenyon. And then some outside groups as well that have helped out the research a lot. One is the East Invest C program, which is a group through the Eastern Association uh, for Trauma um, that gets together with, um, with newer faculty and sort of helps develop their projects and get them off the ground. It's a really nice interaction. You sort of build your project up, get a little bit of uh, um, exposure and helps shape your work. The AAMC, which is a medical colleges group, who has an organization that specifically helps with grant writing, that helps also with program um, development, and I was fortunate to be able to participate with that. Um, the AAST, uh, who is currently funding a lot of this research, and the Department of Surgery, and also the Division of, of uh, Trauma, um, who I couldn't do this without their support. Um, and so... That's them there, these guys. You guys have seen them. And then, of course, uh, you don't get anywhere without home base uh, having it under control. So with that, I'll just open up for questions. <laughs> I got Mbaku up there. That's my favorite Marvel Comics guy, so let's got him up there. He looks like, you know, you want to ask him stuff. <laughs> yes. So, similar all of the media you should look at are to things that we've looked at in some of the animal models. One of the things in congenital heart disease that's starting to be better understood, can you guys hear me? I, I don't want to be too loud because I'm pretty loud to begin with, but um, it's one of the things in congenital heart disease uh, is the use of sildenafil. Yeah. And there's recently some papers coming out looking at sildenafil at least dealing with soluble P-selectin. And it's not really clear um, how it does it, because Tadalafil does not, apparently. Uh -huh. But I wondered if you guys were looking at that at all. We haven't. It's interesting. So the whole area of soluble piece selection is interesting, too, because we don't know if it's a correlation or if it's causative in our model. 
Um, and so we don't know exactly. Also, if if blocking it, blo if blocking soluble p selectin is the thing, or if blocking something that also happens at the same time as soluble p selectin also gets released is actually what is going to be the mechanism. We haven't investigated uh, sildenafil, but it is a very curious question. So. Yes. putting a cross clamp on a vessel or the Ryoba catheter. Uh, we do know that uh, when you cool a patient, the sequela, the uh, patients are able to tolerate the ischemia much better. Yes. Have you measured these P-selectins in patients when you, not in patients, but in your models when you cool them? And, and if you have, what have you seen? Yeah, we haven't done any cooling at this point. Um, one of the things that's really nice is that uh, this institution has a very good collaboration uh, with Travis Air Force Base uh, and their research group there. Um, some of these studies are not so feasible in mice yet, although we've been able to work it all out, but ultimately a lot of this is going to be done in the pig. And I think because the military already has such an interest in cooling, We'll be able to tag on to other research that may occur with relation to cooling and then get some of their tissue yeah. kind of the same way we're trying to do with the reboa as well well i cool patients on a daily basis yeah I mean, so we you, can just you know, get your blood and, yeah uh, get some blood samples or, <laughs> yeah. or i put cross clamp patients on warm ischemic patients and yeah. you know and it'd be interesting to see if any of these proteins are, are expressed and and if that is the case you know maybe before we put a cross clamp in a patient who you're going to revascularize electively, obviously, yeah. you know, uh, cooling them, they might be able to tolerate it much One better. of the things I think that we've been interested in doing is trying to get vascular tissue that's going out with the biopsy uh, and look for the, for the cell adhesion molecule expression in that. Um, we've been trying to do it both with pigs and then hopefully also with humans too. Uh, pigs, we get the Reboas up all the time. We don't know, like if we have pigs that have it up for differential amounts of time, we could correlate that with the type and uh, amount of cell adhesion molecule expression that we get. Um, but then potentially if you have an acute ischemic event also in a vascular patient and you, for example, cut that tissue out, that's something that we could take and we could stain it and look for sort of the same thing. Um, we, because we're a base science lab, we do a lot of stuff uh, with controlled um, variables, but uh, the human tissue, I think even just sort of demonstrating that it actually happens uh, would be neat. We want to, for example, look at like a, a zone one Reboa, see if we get cell adhesion molecule expression in the, in the mesenteric vasculature and distally in the leg. Um, and then there'd be similar interest uh, with, uh, with peripheral tissue that we get from, a, um, from acute ischemic events. For example, so if you had uh, acute mesenteric ischemia from, uh, from say like uh, atrial fibrillation or whatever, and some of the bowel ended up being compromised and cut out. Yeah. Yeah, we would take some of that bowel, for example, we could get some of that vasculature and we could stain it and find that and see what, what it looks like. I think it'd be curious. So Ian, great work. Uh, it's really been fun to see how you've evolved from the beginning and also the bench to bedside, bedside to bench uh, questioning and uh, the, the great correlation with the patients that we had today. I mean, it's really, these are real questions that need uh, basic science solutions and that if we stop asking these kinds of questions, we, we don't uh, progress. I was really curious about the contra coup um, lung. So you've said that the peace collector was upregulated in, in those, that tissue as well. Do you think that's a systemic effect or something particularly uh, selected to For the lung, lung tissue? Yeah. Uh, so how does, it, how does it get that message? That's a good question. Uh, we don't really know. I think we've got a lot of livers and spleens and, and, and kidneys sitting in jars right now waiting to figure that out if it does end up getting expressed there. Um, my suspicion is that if we want to know for sure if something happens systemically, it's not just P-selectin that we have to look for. It's cell adhesion molecules in general because the vasculature is going to be different in different places, so the same signal might cause a different cell adhesion molecule response in different tissues. Um, but uh, I think 
sort of what our bandwidth right now, we haven't been able to answer that question, but we have been setting ourselves up to do so when we can expand our bandwidth a little bit. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, and so we're, we're pretty excited about it. So yeah, the Contra Coup. Sarah? Similar question. So in the, non in the non injured lung of mm -hmm. the animals that were injured compared to the sham, have you looked at those, you know, the non injured segment of the lungs? Yeah, so P-selectin is basically widely upregulated in all the lung tissue. Um, we don't know if it's a pulmonary specific signal or if it's um, um, or if it's a systemic signal or if it's just, I mean, I guess even in theory, it could just be that enough energy was transmitted throughout the entire chest cavity to do that. And maybe that's not a very high uh, bar to do. But um, yeah, so I think we're still kind of wondering that that answer sir dr greenhall so uh along similar lines have you ever has anyone ever looked at barrow trauma or trauma induced through the trachea and upregulation of p-selectin maybe through uh, high vent pressures or yeah i think we know some trachea. people that have done that <laughs> yeah so we have actually a collaboration with nick kenyon uh and uh we use their ventilator uh, basically with a high, you know, with barotrauma to see if it exacerbates the injury that we see. But we also have shams in that group as well to compare the uh, P-selecting expression without the direct injury and with. We have just finished um, injuring all our mice with that and we're currently in the process of uh, examining all our histology and immunofluorescence to answer just exactly that question. Uh, I mean, you can imagine with uh, pulmonary contusion that's going to change the way everything flows through the lung, both uh, in terms of uh, the vasculature and in the air spaces. And so um, the barotrauma should potentially be exacerbated in some of the areas. And so, uh, so we think that's going to be pretty fascinating to see if it uh, actually makes that injury worse. Ian, great work. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Appreciate it.